Um, but the subject matter for this evening uh, has to do with, with increasing your knowledge, increasing your wisdom, and basically just, just overall kind of getting smarts, right? Being smart. As, as believers, as Christians, you know, the Bible puts a uh, um, emphasis on being intelligent, being smart. Now, we're going to look at a lot of different things when it comes to, you know, the world's wisdom versus God's wisdom and things like that. But, but by and large, you know, I don't believe that Christians should be ignorant. That we shouldn't be viewed, you know, the world's going to view us as being ignorant regardless, but we should not be ignorant people. Now, the word ignorant just itself really isn't necessarily always a bad thing. It just means you don't know. There's a difference between being ignorant and being stupid, right? So if someone's calling you stupid, it's more like being a fool or being someone that, you know, you've been given opportunities to learn and you just refuse to learn. You don't want to know. Um, but being ignorant, you can be ignorant on a lot of things. I'm ignorant of a lot of things. There's a lot of things I don't know and I don't know how to do. And all that word means is I just don't know it, right? You don't know what you don't know. So the things that you don't know, you're ignorant of. One thing we definitely don't want to be ignorant of, though, is God's word. Right? I mean, you believe God's word. You should never be ignorant of what God's word says, which is why you need to be in it all the time. And there's a few things I just want to cover before we really get into kind of more of the meat of this sermon. But um, the Bible talks about sinning through ignorance in Leviticus chapter 4 and Numbers 15. And we're not going to turn there. But I just want you to be aware of that, that that's in the scripture. So, you know, using an excuse of, well, I didn't know, doesn't cut it. So if you're sinning, if you're doing something that's wrong and that's a sin according to God's word, just because you don't know doesn't mean well, you get a free pass for that then. No, if it's a sin, it's still a sin, whether you knew it or not. There's a lot of things that my wife didn't know when we got married, you know, when she, had, she got saved about a year before we got married and I remember having discussions with her and she just didn't, there's like a lot of things she just didn't know because she wasn't raised at all in any type of religious home. She had no idea what the Bible said, what it was taught and all. So she had a completely worldly background as far as what's right and what's wrong and no real standard anyways of, as to what's right and wrong. So drinking and, and fornication and things like this she didn't really know that they're wrong, but does that absolve a person from, from all wrongdoing? Well, you didn't know. No, because if that were the case, then we could just burn all of the Bibles and all of God's Word and just say, well, we all don't know, so we're going to get off the hook. No, that's, that's not the way it works. Even if you sin through ignorance, now, there is, it, it is a little bit different. Even in God's eyes, there's... there's, there's somewhat different atonements, you know, and you can read through Leviticus 4, Numbers 15, you still have sacrifices, you still have sin offerings, you still, you know, in, in his, uh, in, in God's judgment, you know, way of dealing with, with some of these sins. But the bottom line is you still need to know it. You're still going to be held responsible, right? So as soon as you find out, oh man, I've sinned, I didn't know that was a sin. Yeah, it was a sin and, and you're going to be held responsible for that. So that's one of the reasons why we don't want to be ignorant because even if you didn't know, you're still responsible for it, right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, the laws here. If you're driving a car, you're, you're expected to know what the laws are. You can't just say, well, I didn't know that I couldn't do that. They won't use that as, you know, in, in the court system here, they won't use that as a valid excuse. Oh, well, I didn't know. Well, it's your obligation to know. And in a sense, God's the same way with his word. He's like, well, you have my laws. You have my word. You're expected to know these things. And if you don't know them, that doesn't make it, it still doesn't mean you didn't break his laws, right? You, you either break them or you didn't. So we don't want to be ignorant, one, of God's word. We want to make sure we know them because sinning through ignorance is still a sin. Now, there's some people, we started off in 2 Peter chapter 3, that are willfully ignorant. And being willfully ignorant puts you in the fool category. Because these are people that... Not only do they not know something, they don't want to know. We ought to, as God's children, strive to want to know things, to have more knowledge, to increase our learning, increase our knowledge, 
increase our wisdom, understand more and more and more. We should always be striving to learn and to grow. But people who are willfully ignorant are fools. Look at verse number 3 in 2 Peter chapter 3 where we started off this evening. By words, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So these people are, are mocking, they're scoffing, they're walking after their own lusts, they're, they're just happy being in their sins and saying, yeah, that old book, well, where... Where is God? Where is the promise of his coming? Yeah, supposedly Jesus Christ is going to come back. It's been 2,000 years. You know, do you really think he's coming back? This is the attitude that's being described here and saying, hey, things are just continuing the same way it has been. So why should we worry about that? And the Bible says in verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of. They are willingly ignorant. It's not that they want to know and they want to understand. They don't. They're, they're, just, they're just scoffing at it. They're mocking it and just blowing it off. Oh, no big deal. They are being willingly ignorant. It says, For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So basically what this is saying that they are willingly ignorant of is the fact that one, God's already judged the earth once with a flood and that he's going to judge the earth again. That's why it says that by the same word, the word of God, the same word that tells us about the flood that happened when God judged the world a long time ago, the same words telling us there's going to be another judgment and this time by fire. And he's saying they're just willingly ignorant of that because what are they talking about? His coming, right? This isn't just talking about the earth being created by God and evolution and stuff like that. This is literally talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, that they're willingly ignorant of that because they're just completely ignoring, hey, God's already destroyed the earth once and he's going to do it again. And they, just, they don't want to think about that. They don't want to know about that. They want to continue walking in their lusts. They're fools. Fools. Because this is going to happen whether they want it to or not. This is the truth. And they need to just get their heads out of their rears and say, it is what it is. This is a fact. And then it says in verse number eight, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So he's basically telling us, you know, beloved, save people. Hey, don't let that, don't let their mocking and saying, oh, it's been this long. Don't let that bother you. Just remember that, yeah, maybe it's been a couple thousand years, but for, with God, it's like a day. With God, that's, that's no big deal. We don't need to be worried about the amount of time that has lapsed because God made the promise and God's word is true and he is coming back. And it doesn't matter if it's been thousands of years because to God, it's just, it might have just been yesterday. And it's just as sure as if it was one day to pass or thousands of years to pass. It's just as sure. But notice that, that phrase, because we're gonna, I'm going to read some other phrases that are very similar to this. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. That phrase is found multiple times in Scripture. And you have to turn these places, I'll read them for you. But over and over again, we see, don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant. God wants us to know. He wants us to have wisdom. He wants us to have knowledge. Romans eleven twenty five. 25, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. 1 Corinthians 10, 1, moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. 1 Corinthians 12, 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. 2 Corinthians 1, 8, for we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant of Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Over and over and over again, we're seeing, and when it says, I would not, it means I don't want you to be. I don't want you to be ignorant about this. Don't be ignorant about this. You need to know about this. Don't be ignorant. Like it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you know, let no man deceive you by any means. I don't want you to be tricked. I want you to have knowledge. I want you to understand these things. They're going to happen. They're coming to pass. Don't be the ignorant Christian. 
Don't be the person who needs to be spoon-fed everything, that the only things you know are what you've heard in church. Don't be ignorant because you're only hearing a very small sample of the whole Word of God no matter what church you go to. Now, we have a tendency to, to cover more Scripture in our church and churches like ours than many other churches do. And, and you know, I thank God for that. I thank God that I was in a church where it wasn't just one verse and then the whole rest of the sermon is just talking and talking and just hearing whatever comes out of man's heart. But even still, even in the church that's using the most Scripture, you're still only getting a small glimpse of the whole Word of God. And if you rely just on that, you are going to be ignorant on many, many, many things. We need to be studying and reading for ourselves. God does not want you to be ignorant, which is why he's he went through the lengths to preserve His words for us for thousands of years. He made sure that His words do not fail so that you would not be ignorant. Now, there's an attitude that people have, and, and we don't want to bring a bad name on Christianity, on Jesus Christ, on the Lord, on, on the Bible, on any of this stuff, because we are ignorant. Like I said, the world's already going to view us as being ignorant, but we ought not to actually be ignorant. I mean, you're going to just get used to it now if you're going to quote the Bible, if you're going to preach God's word. People are going to call you uneducated. People are going to call you stupid, a moron, and all these other names. Because they don't like what you're saying or because they disagree or whatever, people always say, oh, you need to get educated. If you read some of the comments on social media, on YouTube and things like that, it's laughable. Because these people have no idea what I believe or what my, or not what I believe, but like whatever my knowledge is or my background, how much I've studied, whatever. That doesn't matter to any of them as far as they're concerned. Well, I don't like what you're saying. You're an idiot. You're uneducated. Doesn't matter. And you know what? I don't need to prove to these naysayers and to these scoffers, oh, well, I'm really educated and you, you, know, you should see how many degrees I have or whatever. It doesn't matter. But what does matter is being intelligent, being able to have intelligent conversations with people, especially when you're trying to persuade them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. We don't want to be viewed as just some dumb, redneck, backwoods country. I don't know nothing. I don't, I don't know nothing from nothing, but I know I got Jesus. Look, if you're saved, praise God. You know, that is the most important knowledge that you can have is that saving faith in Jesus Christ. But don't just stop there. Don't just be content to be an imbecile. Okay, God wants to use you and he's going to use you way more if you can actually, you know, put more than two words together and form complete comprehensive sentences and, and full thoughts and be educated and be able to, to teach others and to increase learning and increase wisdom and increase knowledge. We ought to strive to learn more and more and to increase our learning. The Bible says in 1 Peter uh, chapter number 2, if you want to just flip over to 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 15, the Bible says, For so is the will of God that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. See, the foolish men are the ones who is ignorant about the things of God. But the Bible's saying one way that we combat their statements is by our works, is by doing what's right. And that with well-doing, we can put to silence their ignorance. I mean, I can't tell you, and, and, and this, is, this is part of, what prompted this. I've had people, I, I, I posted a sermon up on Psalm 15. And I put Psalm 15 in, in uh, it was something, the title is something like, In whose eyes a vile, a vile person is contemned. Right? Contemned is an older word. It's not common in today's language, right? It's not in many people's vocabulary unless you're reading the Bible. But how many people are like, Oh, you don't even know how to spell the word contempt. Oh, you don't even know. You know, it's like, it's just pure ignorance. 
Yes, I do know how to spell the word contempt. And you apparently don't understand that the word contempt is an actual word. It's a real word. You need to get some learning and some understanding. Now, I'm not going to go and, and, and just answer every fool out there. But we ought to know these things. And you know, that's why I'm glad that, that Brother Devin preached. I was able I had a chance to listen to the sermon from last week. You know, and, and what he was preaching on the King James dictionary, right? That that this is a the Bible can be our dictionary in defining words. He brought up some good examples of words that, that yeah, they may be a little bit harder, but you know what? God doesn't want you to be a dunce. He wants you to understand all of his words. And if there's something that you don't know, hey, figure it out, look it up, spend some time in it. Don't just ignore everything you don't know. Let's try to learn and increase our learning even more. And he gave you good tools on how to do that, even just within the context of Scripture. So that's why it's you know, a real good sermon about that stuff. But uh, flip back over to chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. There's quite a few verses in the Bible. This I might skip some of what I have, but just to, to get through and see how important learning is and why it's so important to us and that, and that we, we can't just be content. And, and you know what? This passes on to our kids also. You know, just because you might not have the most knowledge, if you're responsible for raising your children, you know, do your best to raise your children to have smarts, to, to get an education, to learn, to grow, to, to know more, to know more than you do. I hope my children can grow and exceed in all aspects of my life, spiritually and knowledge and everything. I would love to see them all grow up to know more than I do, to do more than I do. That would be awesome. And I'm going to try to do my best to raise them to do such. I don't want them just being ignorant fools and, and getting eaten up by the world because that's what's going to happen when you're ignorant, especially when you're ignorant of God's word. That is the most important thing. Our homeschool curriculum starts off with my children reading their Bibles every day. That is first and foremost. And you know how it ends? It ends with me reading the Bible to them every night. That's our curriculum. You do what you want to do, but I, put, I like to have an emphasis on God's Word, God's Word. Now, in between, there's a lot of other learning that goes on. They're learning math, English, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, all that stuff. Everything that they need to know. Why? That's important too. You need to have smart. You, you want to understand things. You want to have knowledge. And knowledge has to do with things that are true. Okay? Obviously, God's word is true. That's why the emphasis is there. When it comes to things outside of God's word, well, some things are true and some things aren't. And one of the reasons we don't send our kids off to public school is because I have no control over what they're being taught. Because a lot of what's taught in public school is not true. They're teaching falsehoods and lies. And I don't want my kids to learn lies. I want them to learn what's true. But we also introduce other subjects to them outside of Scripture to help them to learn and to grow. Now, 2 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 14. The Bible reads, Wherefore, beloved, Seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. There are some things in scripture that are harder to understand. Some things are very easy. Read Genesis 1. It's very easy. But there's other areas of scripture in some of the major prophets and just in other places of the Bible that, you know what, this is a little bit harder to understand. I don't quite exactly get what it's saying. This is one of the reasons why we don't want to be unlearned and definitely not unstable. Because people are unlearned and unstable. They, they rest it. They, they wrestle with it. They don't, they don't know how to make sense of it. So they kind of twist it around. And when you start twisting God's word around, you do that to your own destruction. And we don't want to just, just come up with these false doctrines merely because we're unlearned. And we just, just don't even understand and we don't know. And we, you know. 
we need to get a solid foundation in God's word and build and increase our learning and our knowledge so we could understand more and more. And even the, the dark sayings and the things that are harder to understand, we ought to strive to get the knowledge of those things so that we're not twisting God's word and, uh, and misapplying it. Verse number 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be, both, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. It says there in verse 18, Grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God wants you to grow in your knowledge, grow, increase your wisdom, increase your knowledge. Uh, flip over to Proverbs. We're going to see some passages from Proverbs here. Proverbs chapter 1. Of course, Proverbs chapter, the whole book of Proverbs is about wisdom and, and understanding wisdom and instruction. And I'll just read through. I want to get through a lot of stuff for sake of time. So as you're turning, I'm going to start reading in verse number one. The Bible reads, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. So we've seen already in the first four verses what it's about. It's about knowing wisdom, knowing instruction, being instructed in wisdom, getting understanding, getting knowledge, having discretion. That's what the book's about. The entire book. God thought it was important enough to get wisdom and knowledge. He dedicated an entire book of the Bible and the book of Proverbs to just help give you basic understanding, wisdom, knowledge. All things are going to help you in your life every day of your life. And he's packed it into this book. Now, obviously, the entire Bible is full of wisdom and knowledge that we ought to strive for. But, but Proverbs really packs in a lot of, of just basic wisdom and it's condensed into one book that if you study that book, that will do way more for you in your life than all of the, the secular knowledge is going to give you. The, the book of Proverbs is gonna, is gonna really help steer your path from, from leading a life that's gonna lead into destruction. Think about it. No matter, no matter how smart you may be or get or how much learning you may acquire in any one particular field or facet or something that you can study and just get all understanding of any particular thing. Let's say it's rocket science or let's say, you know, whatever. Biology, anatomy, any subject. It doesn't matter how much you get at that if you don't understand the really important truths of like, hey, stay away from the strange woman. Hey, stay away from alcohol. Hey, stay away from fornication. Stay away from these things that the book of Proverbs is really going to teach you about because your life will just be destroyed and everything that you thought you learned and it was so great for you is going to come to nothing. You can be the most, have the highest IQ, let's put it that way. And if you fall in to the, to the stuff that's being taught against in the book of Proverbs, you might as well just throw it all away. Continuing on here in Proverbs 1, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. If you're wise, you're going to want to increase your learning. Let's get smarter. Let's not just be okay with, well, I'm just kind of ignorant. Well, change that. Don't just be okay with that. Don't settle for being dumb. Strive to do more. Now, look. I do believe that God has, has given people different talents and that some people are more apt to learning certain things than others. Some people might be a little bit better at picking up languages than others. Some people might be better at understanding math or understanding science or understanding literature. Or understand, you know, we all have our different skill set. But don't just be content or complacent or just say, well, I'm just not really good at that and just... And just Forget about it. No, we, we ought to want to and strive to increase our learning and increase our knowledge. Um, the Bible says in verse number six, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Um, flip over to Proverbs chapter nine. We're going to see basically the same thing. 
I'm going to read from Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4, 5 says, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom, understanding. Saying, don't forsake her. She's going to preserve you. She's going to keep you going through this life. Wisdom, knowledge. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all that getting, get understanding. Get the wisdom and understand what you're talking about. Understand what it's talking about. Get that understanding with the wisdom. You're going to get that from God's word primarily. This should be your source of wisdom. Um, Proverbs 9.9, 9, the Bible says, Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy is understanding. It's basically repeating what we saw already in Proverbs 1. And I've already left out a bunch of stuff. Obviously, the book of Proverbs talks a lot about this. See, we are here as ambassadors for Christ. We are here representing Jesus Christ. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you represent Jesus Christ. We represent Jesus Christ when we go out and preach the gospel, when we preach about Jesus Christ, we try to lead people to Christ. We are here. We have a job. We need to walk worthy, as we saw this morning, of the vocation that we have, the job that he's entrusted with us, being an ambassador. Let's not represent Jesus Christ as an idiot. Let's learn. Let's get some education. Let's, let's try to increase our knowledge. We ought to be smart. And especially if you want to be a teacher of God's word, you really need to continually put forth an effort to increase your knowledge. Anybody striving or having a desire to be a bishop, to be a pastor one day, take the time to learn. And this is really important. I've taught this in the preaching class before, but I'll just you know, say it in front of everybody because this is good information to have. When you, and, and this goes, this is just the way that people are. You know, we ought to become all things to all men that we might by all means say, save some. When you preach and when you speak, when you sound, even though you might have a lot of wisdom and knowledge, but when you just sound like you have no clue what you're talking about and you're just using language that just sounds really uneducated, and I don't mean you have to throw around the big terms, right? But I mean, when you're just always using slang and just, and just not really forming proper sentences, you're going to be viewed, on, viewed as on the, in the world's eyes as just being really ignorant. And if you're trying to persuade people, that's not going to be a very good way. Oftentimes, people will kind of turn off their thinking. If, if you just continue to hear a preacher and they're just always just using bad grammar and not able to read and not able to just pronounce things, it's a lot harder to put your trust in learning from somebody and you're like, can you read a sentence? You know? Now, we ought to, on the flip side, obviously, be humble, be ready to receive, to, to recognize, well, maybe this person does have a lot of wisdom in other areas. But, but try to receive what you can from God's word. But we don't want to, as a preacher, to have people combat that. You need to be, you know, learned yourself to be able to give people um, this understanding and to be able to teach and to give instruction. Jesus, now Jesus in the world's eyes, did not have an education because the Pharisees were surprised by this. They were like, well, how does this man learn, you know, having, having never been taught, right? He didn't go through our Pharisee school. And back then, you know, not everybody was just being educated um, to read and to write and do things. So they're looking at Jesus. Well, how does he even know this stuff? But he was, he, he did have knowledge. He did have wisdom and he was able to speak very well. We have his words that are preserved for us. He taught very well. He was very knowledgeable and very wise. So you don't have to get all of your learning and instruction from some institution like the Pharisee institution. But we do, we should, and we ought to be smart. The same thing with his disciples. They were blue collar guys. They didn't have some big you know, uh, education, some big college degree, university degree. But they were able to recognize, hey man, these guys, they're able to preach and preach boldly and, and, and preach good doctrine and, and be very coherent in their speech. They, were get, they had gotten learning and gained wisdom and knowledge and understanding to the point to where they were able to teach and to preach to other people and to convince them, even though they didn't have all the accolades that come with an with a educational institution. So just because you don't 
gain, you know, you don't, well, my point is you don't have to go to some university to get an education, to get smarts. You can learn and get wisdom and get knowledge through many other means. You know, start by reading books, reading your Bible. That's the first place to start with and, uh, and hearing from God's word. The Bible says in, in Hosea 4, you could turn, if you would, to um, turn to Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. In Hosea 4, there's a warning actually about not having knowledge. The Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You really, and, and my people, right? God's people. As a born-again believer, we need to increase our learning. We need to have knowledge so that we're not destroyed. Ultimately, why? Because sin will destroy you. You don't have, you don't have the knowledge from God's word. You'll be destroyed. It says, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. In James chapter 1, the Bible tells us in verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So if you say, well, I've never been very smart. Nothing's ever really come easily to me. I've always had to work and struggle to try to learn. And, and it's always been a challenge. Pray to God. That's good. That's right. Because we already know that if, if we ask God according to his will, he hears us and he'll answer us. And since we see here that the Bible says, hey, if you lack wisdom, let's ask God. He'll give to you liberally. He's not just going to give you even just a little. He says he's going to pour out with. Why? Because he wants you to have wisdom. He wants you to have knowledge. He wants you to be smart. If you have problems, maybe you have a learning disability, you're dyslexic, you have other problems that are hindering you, don't give up and don't just be okay just saying, well, I'm just never going to be that smart. Look, ask God to help you. I believe that this is true in James chapter 1. I believe that God will make you smarter. But you know what? You've got to stick with it and you've got to put forth the effort. But if you're asking God and if that's your, you know, those that desire and, and or that hunger and thirst after truth, after righteousness, they're going to be filled. In the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, we already covered that. You hunger and, and thirst, you're going to be filled. God will fill you with the learning. In Daniel chapter 1, look at verse number 17. We see another example of this. This is uh, talking about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? Children of Israel, they were taken captive and brought into Babylon. It says, as for these four children, verse 17, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel understanding in all visions and dreams. So God is the one that gave these four individuals learning, understanding, knowledge. Pray to God that he'll give you that understanding and that knowledge. You want to know more? You want to increase your learning? Start by praying to God because God is capable of giving you that, that understanding as the scripture already says here in Daniel chapter 1. He gave it to these four. Let's keep reading. Verse 18. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. This is really interesting because you have somebody, this worldly king, Nebuchadnezzar, right? Even he is able to see that the wisdom and understanding in God's people is 10 times better than the worldly wisdom of the magicians, the astrologers, these other people who are just taught in the ways of the world. Why? Because truth is truth is truth is truth. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, it doesn't matter where it comes from. Truth is truth, right? We know that all of God's words are true. And so when you're brought up and, and gaining wisdom from God and you're getting this understanding, well, they have pure truth and wisdom that they're getting from God. Whereas these other people, yeah, they know, they know a lot about what they've been taught, but what they've been taught is, contains a lot of falsehoods, which means that how is that going to play out? They're going to fail a lot more. Because they don't have a proper understanding of things. When you don't understand things, you're going to end up making bad decisions. You're going to fail at, at you know, a certain task or whatever. 
uh, you see that you know so much just think about even in the medical science community right and science is, a, is the pursuit of knowledge right you're supposed to be understanding knowledge um, and that's what true science is and when people have real science because it's real truth you're able to use it and have a good outcome but when you don't really know and you haven't factored everything in and, and you're, you're missing some knowledge and missing some understanding, you kind of go off into these various directions that lead you down a wrong path. And that's, I mean, just look all throughout history, man's wisdom has failed in, in so many. Now, you know, obviously you could say you're improving because you're learning more and more, uh, especially collectively as people start to learn more and gain more knowledge off of, uh, off of history, you can, you can, start coming to more of a truth but even even then when it comes to the world's wisdom you could you could be headed one way that's false and then they go oh wait that's wrong we're going this way and that way is still false and, th and this is kind of the way it happens throughout history a lot too they don't ever quite uh, sometimes they make it and sometimes they they miss it as far as the mark of just the this is the truth and um which is why, again, we start with the scripture. Now, he found, Nebuchadnezzar will find these people 10 times better than everyone else because they had this knowledge and wisdom and understanding given to them from God. Jump back up to verse number three. The Bible says, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. So in these refugees, in these people that have been taken captive, now that's refugees, but, but in, the, in the people who came captive from Israel that, that have been brought into Babylon, the king wants to find some young people that they're bright, they're smart, they're intelligent. He wants to use them in his kingdom, right, for his own purposes. But he has this, uh, this list to saying, you know, you need to be skillful in wisdom, cunning in knowledge, and understanding science. This is what he's looking for. And he found all of these things in these four Hebrews, in Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He found that in all of them. And I believe that God wants us to be understanding science also. Because like I said before, science is the pursuit of knowledge. It's just knowing things. And that's, you know, true science, what science truly is, it's just learning truth. And when you understand the way things operate and the way things work and what's true, that's great. I'm all for science. And God's all for science. And he wants you to be smart with science. But the problem is that there's a science that's falsely so-called, as 1 Timothy 6 says in verse number 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. See, people want to combat truth, like truth from God's word, real wisdom, real knowledge, and say, oh, no, no, well, science says that's not true. And since science is supposed to be truth, right? It's a pursuit of truth. When it, con when it conflicts with what the scripture says, well, we know that God's word is true. So your so-called science isn't true. That's why it's so-called science, because people are putting a label on it as being true, but it's not really true. And the people who are opposing have oppositions of God's word. If they want to say, well, this is science, it's not really science. They're falsely calling it science. So people want to say, well, we know that evolution is true and it's already been, science says that we've evolved and that there was a big bang. Not true. That's not science. They can call it science till they're blue in the face, but it's not truth. It's not knowledge. It's not science. It's a lot of assumptions. It's pseudoscience. They, they start off with, and I'm not going to get all into the evolutionary side of things. I, I easily could. It's a subject that's been very intriguing for me personally um, because I used to think that when I was unsaved that people who didn't believe evolution, they're ignorant, they're more, the same exact thing that now I'm teaching, you know, people are going to call us, the same thing that people are calling me, oh, you're ignorant, you're stupid. I did that same, so I guess it's, I'm reaping what I've sown because that's, that's the way that I viewed 
people who didn't believe in evolution and thought, oh yeah, right, we know that this is a fact, but it's just because I believed a lie. I believed that what I was being taught was fact when in, in fact it's fiction. I, wasn't, I was taught to learn this, memorize this, repeat this, but don't challenge this. We need to be critical thinkers. If you're truly interested in truth, you won't just receive everything that you hear. You may be a good student. I was a very good student in school in the sense that, man, I could be a sponge. Whatever they were, were giving to me, I can remember it and give it back. And I could follow their, their line of thinking and just accept all the premises that I, was, that I was given to support whatever they wanted to teach me. But I was very, very bad at challenging what I was being told. And because of that, I wasn't, I didn't have real knowledge in many areas because I I thought that that was the path to truth, was just, hey, these people already looked at this and they learned it and I'm just going to receive it. Foolhardy. We need to learn a challenge. And, and you know what? We need to teach our children to challenge things. Don't be afraid of people challenging, challenging beliefs, challenging, you know, we need to teach them what's true, teach your children what's right and what's true and to stand on the word of God. But at the same time, they ought to have a mind that's capable of challenging things so that they could learn and know things for themselves. You want them to be independent thinkers to be able to analyze the information and look at it and, and come up with their, with their conclusions on what's true and false and not just rely on other people to tell you what's true and false. We don't, we're no one, you know, when they're younger, they do need to be spoon-fed. When you have an infant, they need to have their food prepared for them and given to them. And as they grow up, they get weaned off of that, right? And when they're still young, like my children's age, they still need to have the bills paid for them. They still need to have their food, you know, kind of prepared with them. Someone needs to go out to the store, and, you know, and still do preparation to help them. But the older they get, the more they should be able to do those things on their own, right? Same thing with the teaching and the instruction. You start off teaching your children, this is a fact, this is, you know, they need to trust you as their parent. But you also want to instill in them a challenge, a way to think, a means of saying, well, why is that? Right. And when they, when they ask you questions, it's great, but sometimes it's good to turn it around on them and ask them and get their minds thinking. Instead of just giving them all of the answers all of the time, Make them think critically. Make them figure out how to find the answer. Guide them in the way of truth, but make them do it. We need people that can challenge and, and to be able to be smart and think about things so that you don't just become deceived by the false prophets that are out there and just by the, the, the science falsely so-called in this world that's trying to turn people's faith upside down because... They're being told, oh, yeah, this is all fact, this is all proven, and these guys are really smart, and you can't possibly understand that. Well, what if you are able to understand what they're talking about? And then you actually dig into it and do some research and realize, huh, wow, they really don't have a leg to stand on. There is an assumption at the, at the base and at the core of evolution, it's all based on assumptions. See, they try to show you all the facts after the assumption's already been made. Well, see, look, here's some evidence and here's, and here's some data and here's some tests and we can reproduce these tests. Yeah, but you started off going the wrong direction over here just based on an assumption that you have no idea about, like the, the radiocarbon dating. You don't know how much carbon started off in that thing. You may be able to test the rate of decay of where we're at right now. Right. You can't tell me that the conditions have always been the same throughout millions of years because you, you think that things are millions of years old. You cannot prove the, the, even the rate has been the same because all conditions have been the same. You can't prove that. You have to assume that. Not only that, you have to assume that it started off with whatever level you think it started at. But if there's a God that created things, maybe he didn't create it with a full amount of, car you know, of carbon or whatever. And maybe the conditions were different. 
There, there's so many things that you can just say, well, what about this? What about this? What about this situation? Well, what if there is a, a whole disaster and a global flood? Well, what if, there, you know, does that change conditions a little bit? Oh, yeah, but that didn't happen. Because if all that happened, then that would mean the God of the Bible is true, and we can't have that. We ought to be intelligent enough, though, to not be deceived. And we ought to strive for that. And, again, the, the, the number one priority is in Scripture and God's Word. But I think we should also branch out into other areas of truth, where you could know it's lining up. This is why, you know, I preach a sermon against vaccines and things like that. When, when you can spot things, if it's not lining up, with truth and knowledge that you can gain from the Bible. And, and here's what I mean by that, too, because I, I preach this already. But you think about, if you come from the view and understanding, having the knowledge and wisdom, understanding that God created everything, and when he created it, he created it, it was very good. When he looked at his creation, it was very good. And the way that he designed our bodies. And you can go in and, and see all the mechanisms that God has created to help our bodies fight diseases and to, and to deal with our environments and to deal with everything. And you can look at all of God's creation in our, in our system, but then to say, well, we're still flawed. And if you don't inject poison and disease into your child when they're six months old or when they're six weeks old or when they're two weeks old, then they might get sick and die and that's going to help them. That, you know, yeah, God created us good, but still not that good, because if we don't inject them with disease when they're a newborn, then they're going to get sick and die. Sorry, that doesn't line up with the knowledge and wisdom that I've already received from Scripture. It doesn't add up. Something's faulty there. Something's not working out right. And if you go back and look at the science, I guarantee you, that they come to these conclusions as a science falsely so-called. Guaranteed. Let's keep going here. Um, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, because this kind of leads us into my last main point here. The difference between the wisdom of this world and just, just truth and wisdom um, that comes from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 17, the Bible says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, the rest of this passage is going to help us understand what he's talking about here. Well, not with wisdom. I thought you just said, Pastor Burson, that, you know, we want to have wisdom. We want to increase learning so that we can be a better ambassador and so that we could, you know, answer people's questions and that we could, you know, be able to explain things better. Yes, we should. The wisdom of words that he's referring to here is referring to the world's wisdom. And he's going to make that clear. It's going to become uh, uh, evident in the context of the passage as we keep going. So that's why you can't just stop there and be like, oh, well, see, I don't need to be smart. Look, you should be smart. But the problem is that the, the preaching of the gospel, the world's going to look at that as being ignorant and foolish. And the wisdom of the world is going to say that's nonsense. So he's saying we don't need to use wisdom of words. And we don't need to... to also get into some uh, worldly wisdom of trying to prove everything because people need to believe. But um, and when I say prove everything, let me, let me be careful. Let me restate that. Prove it in the sense, because when I'm thinking things, I don't always, I'm not articulating the way I want to. Proving things in the sense of if you were to go down like a mathematical proof, right, and just say, uh, this is why God exists and this is what, you know, and, and, and lay it all out like that. Because at the end of the day, you'll never be able to do that to prove the existence of God and to prove beyond any doubt that this is the truth. That's why it's taken by faith. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense or that it's illogical. It's very logical, but you can't just use this 
wisdom of words to just be airtight. You know, there is, this is an absolute proof of, you know, of God's existence or that the Bible is true or whatever. That has to be taken on faith because if it can be 100% provable, then you wouldn't need faith at all. There is no level of, of putting faith on something if it's just 100% completely um, beyond the shadow of a doubt proven. But let's keep reading here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 18. Or let's keep reread verse number 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, there's a lot going on there in verse number 21, but I'll break it down for you like this. Because what, what he's doing is contrasting the wisdom of the world with the wisdom of God. The wisdom of the world is going to say, what well, we believe is foolish, that the Bible is foolish, that preaching is foolish, that you can't learn anything from that because it's not science. Right? That's what they're going to rely on. When in fact, you can say the Bible is a science book because it's truth. In its truest sense, it is science. It is knowledge. It is truth. But um, what this verse is saying here, for that, after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. What well, says the world by wisdom? It's by the world's wisdom they knew not God. So they're saying, oh, well, God doesn't exist because of our wisdom. They're relying on the world's wisdom. They're relying on the Big Bang. They're relying on the evolution to say, well, yeah, that God doesn't exist because I know that this is how things happened, not the way Genesis says things happened. By wisdom, they knew not God. And that's why God looks at that and goes, <laughs> it says it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He said, wow, well, here's what I'm going to do. You think you're so smart? I'm going to take something that you think is just completely foolish and use that as the mechanism for your soul to be saved. Which means you'll have to humble yourself to believe in something that you just think is foolish and through the mouth of a person who you think is foolish, this preaching, because your wisdom, your world's wisdom is pointing you towards destruction. Your world's wisdom is telling you there is no God. Well, I'm going to use this preacher man who you think is nuts, who you think is ignorant, who you think is uneducated and unlearned, I'm going to use this guy in order for your soul to get saved. And you know what? It pleased God. That pleases God. You know, it gives you a little bit of, of uh, insight into the mind of God. <laughs> he looks at that and says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. This is how you're going to know. So verse number 22 says, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we... Preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. So the Jews are looking for this sign. Preaching Christ crucified is a stumbling block for the Jews. I don't know what more sign they're looking for than everything that they'd already received. That's a huge stumbling block for them to not believe on the crucifixion of Christ or the resurrection of Christ for that matter. It says, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So they're always trying to be philosophical and, and increase their learning in the world's ways of thinking. And that's why preaching to the Greeks is foolishness. You're saying you're not proving anything by your preaching and relying just on God's word. And you use your circular reasoning. And I know it's true because, it says, because the Bible says it's true. And that, that's not good enough for me. And I need, you know. And ultimately, that is what we stand on. And what I preach, I'm just saying, well, because it's the Bible said so, that's why. Because it's God's word. Because at, at the beginning of everything, it has to come from faith. 
but the faith to recognize, hey, this is God's word. If this is God's word, everything that's in here is true. Amen. Absolutely. That is my premise. Right. Yeah. And that is the foundation. But then it says in verse number 24, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The wisdom of the world's foolishness. The wisdom of God is true wisdom, it's truth, it's knowledge. Um, and that's what we need to be striving for. Last place, uh, you don't have to turn if you want to, is this Isaiah chapter 50. I already brought up this point where the Pharisees marveled at Jesus because he wasn't educated. But in Isaiah chapter 50, we see a, um, a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Verse number four, the Bible says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. So again, the knowledge and the wisdom is coming from the Lord. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened mine ear and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. So that's, and that's where it starts to get into more of the, the prophetical stuff that you probably remember, recognize as, as representative of Jesus Christ. But it says there in verse 4 that the Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned. He got that from the Lord. And the Lord hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious. So God opened up the ear to receive the learning, and I didn't become willfully ignorant and refuse it, but received it. God wants us to learn. He wants us to increase knowledge, not just to memorize propaganda from the state-run institutions. Okay? And it's not to say that every single thing that's taught in, a, in an institution is just false, but we're not to be so concerned with the wisdom of this world because in so many areas, it's just foolishness anyways. With God, it's definitely foolishness. But we should be interested in learning things that are true. And again, that starts with Scripture, but I think that, um, you know, if you want to understand Scripture, you ought to understand the English language, for example. Right? We have the Bible preserved for us. You want to understand more about God's Word? You, you know, understand just English. Understand grammar. Understand words. Increase your vocabulary. Learn what the word contemned means. Learn what these, these words mean to help you to understand the Bible even better. Thank God we don't have to go to some other language to understand what God's word means. We have it in our native tongue. And you can learn that and just, just become smarter, even in that knowledge, that'll help you in your pursuit of, of learning the truth and knowing the truth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the wisdom and instruction that you've given us. I pray that you please help us to endeavor to, to study and to learn more. We know that studying is, uh, is, a, is weariness and, and, and it's a weariness of the flesh, dear Lord, but I pray that you please help us to place importance on wisdom, place importance on understanding that we would uh, go to you first and foremost for all of our, our truth and our knowledge, Lord, but help us to not be ignorant, but to, uh, to ever increase our learning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.